Narrated by the professional narrator, Christy Lou. All right, anyway. Okay, so this is um, the Earth Fire Touch Trilogy is uh, a series that Will has written. We're going to talk about that later, but this is book two called Moon, Moon World. The second one is, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. The first one is Chrome World. I'm sorry. It is in production now. Moon World is book two. <laughs> and um, this scene is actually, um, I, I chose it because it was part of the audition script. And it's a really, really action-packed scene. Um, just a little bit of background on it. Basically, these are five friends. They're all kind of like outcasts. And um, they're part of what's called Section 8. Um, I, that's a military term to my understanding. But basically, they're all kind of like, you might call them the rejects. So they're all lovable, though. And my heart is so invested in these people. So here we go. Zane and Miguel found Gillian sitting in the corner of the common area, which was much smaller than the enormous hall they enjoyed at Holloman. The drab gray walls offered her no comfort, and they could tell her eyes were puffy and red. She looked depleted, as if all her life force had drained away, and she was simply operating from muscle memory without deliberate effort. The Section 8 crew, minus Chorus, gathered around her with heads hung low and apologetic. Dodge was the first to speak. Girl, this blows. I'm sorry. She fought the tears. Yeah, me too. Miguel's frustration was apparent to all. What the heck happened in there? You knew what to do. His words were sharper than he intended, and he frowned. I don't mean to accuse you of. Gillian lifted a hand to silence him. No worries. She exhaled. I honestly don't know what happened. I kept trying to get in the pink air, but it wasn't released from the case. Her words were slow and deliberate. The harder I tried, the worse it got. Before long, I was out of time, and I passed out. Has this happened before? Memphis asked carefully. You mean not releasing? No, never. She reached to rub her temples. <laughs> Have I got a killer headache? Then why wouldn't it release? Zane demanded. He was angry and didn't try to subdue his tone. No idea, she insisted. Look, it happened. I failed the test. She blinked several times. And I'll go home, she said anemically. When? Dodge asked carefully. Tomorrow afternoon. Apparently they have to arrange a fighter escort. Otherwise they would send me home today. No. Miguel shook his head and greatly resembled a bull. No, this isn't going to happen. We've come too far to fall apart now. Gillian reached for his hand. That's okay, Miguel, she said softly. That's will be okay. Clearly you did something wrong, Weldon observed and immediately received Miguel's stern glare. That's just that, Gillian said softly. I've done that drill several dozen times. I know what to do, and I know how to do it. I'm sure I did nothing wrong. Wait, Miguel leaned forward. What are you saying? She exhaled, nothing. She looked down at the floor. It just doesn't make sense. Why would my pink air container suddenly malfunction during the cut? I don't think it would, Miguel snapped. Something isn't right. Memphis, who had been largely silent up to this point, said, You've done nothing wrong. Thanks, Memphis. Gillian smiled miserably, but it's too late. He shook his head. Not so fast. I've been watching the replay, and I see something very odd. That brought on several excited comments at the same time. Replay? What do you mean? It is not appropriate to record training sessions without permission. Miguel lifted a hand to silence Weldon and then turned to Memphis. Bro, you were recording the tests? Well, not all of them, just mine and Gillian's. Memphis said apologetically, I mean, I wasn't there to record your tests, or I would have. Forget that. Dodge glanced around. What did you record? Well, I was shocked. And I didn't get any quality close-ups, but I think we can replay this and see something truly was wrong. Dodge shook his head. You, you mean we can see what you recorded? Yeah. He shrugged. 
We just need a wall to project upon. As a group, they turned and started scanning the common room. It was crowded with cadets who had little space to spread out and have more privacy. There is no place, Miguel spat. People are everywhere. What about the corridor, Zane asked. Too busy, Memphis dismissed. Dodge cleared his throat. <laughs> You're missing an obvious place. All eyes turned to him. The head. Excuse me, Gillian whispered loudly. You expect us to go to the bathroom together? He shrugged casually. <laughs> Why not? Probably won't be the first time co-eds were in the same bathroom at the same time. Perfect. Let's do this, Zane agreed. It won't take long, and probably no one will notice if we don't draw attention to ourselves. He glanced around the room and realized Drake was watching them with a curious frown. He looked away. Gillian saw his expression. What's wrong? Nothing, he dismissed. I'm just tired of Drake stink-eyeing us all the time. She's not upset to see Gillian sent home, Miguel fumed. I'd feel better if she seemed more surprised and less amused, Dodge observed. Miguel looked around. Now's a good time to visit the head. The group stood in unison. Guys, Dodge's sly grin was obvious. You've never had to sneak around before, have you? We can't just all get up and go to the same bathroom at the same time. Play it cool. We'll trickle in, so to speak. Memphis nodded. Yeah, I'll go run a test and see if it's doable. I'll let you know. A minute later, he sent a confirmation text via ocular computers. Looks like we have a green light, Miguel said and made his way across the room. The group slowly worked their way across the common room to the restroom near the shower tubes. M Memphis cracked the door on the men's restroom and motioned for them to come in. Miguel held up a hand to stop Weldon. Bro, cover our seats. I beg your pardon, Weldon asked. Guard the door. Don't let anyone in. When Weldon hesitated, he said, It's the smart play, and you're the smartest of us. It makes sense. Miguel shut the door on him to stifle his objection. Memphis blinked a few times, and then a beam of light shot out of his eyes and onto the gray walls. Not the best format or resolution, but this will work. After a few seconds, the image of Gillian appeared on the wall. They watched her struggle to clear the case, but couldn't identify the problem. Wait. For it, Memphis whispered. In the film, Gillian turned slightly to the right, giving Memphis a better view. There, he pointed. Dude, Miguel snapped. Stop moving, the picture is jumping around. What are we looking at? Dodge asked. Wait, let me zoom in. The picture grew larger until they could see a closer view of Gillian's backpack and the pink air case. No way, Miguel spat. No freaking way. What is it? Gillian leaned closer. Shine. Dodge whispered when he saw it. Can you freeze that image? You bet. Memphis mumbled, and then the video froze. Let me zoom in just a tad closer. There. It's fairly obvious. Zane still hadn't seen what everyone was gawking at. Where? Right there, Miguel pointed. Her canister is tied to her case with a piece of string. No matter how much she tugged at it, it wouldn't release. And look at the knot. It's all messed up. I'm surprised it held. But who? Gillian asked. And why? I know exactly who it was, Miguel fumed. Drake and her little sidekicks. I don't disagree, Dodge confided. But we have no proof. So? Miguel was ready to storm the gates. We can't just walk around blasting accusations. Miguel's face turned an ugly shade of red. Man, I hate them! Zane thought for a second. Well, maybe we know more than we think. Gillian leaned forward. Gone? Zane hesitated to make sure he was speaking clearly. So, yesterday I was talking with Drake, and she told me I needed to abandon you. He looked around. All of you. Dodge shook his head. Sorry, bro. That's not enough. There's more. Today, during the test, we were sitting together on the benches. Drake asked Chorus if he if had everything covered. Okay, Dodge smiled. That's interesting. Chorus nodded and said he had it covered. But what is eat? Miguel demanded. 
I'm guessing sabotaging her gear. Dodge shook his head. Not good enough. We need something that connects Chorus to her gear. Bah! Miguel moaned. We don't have anything. We have the evidence of sabotage, Zane said hopefully. I mean, we all saw the footage. Bro, Dodge said sadly. We can't show this footage to anyone. The first thing they do is ask where we got it. Why, right here, Drill Sergeant. Memphis has a secret computer hidden away that he uses to control everything he's not supposed to. Zane sagged. Yeah, there's that. If only we could tie that string to Chorus. Gillian moaned. I'll tie it around his neck. Miguel glared. Nice. Dodge fist bumped him. Zane stood taller. Wait a minute. Maybe we can. Back in basic. He glanced back and forth. Remember the day we played the war games and I captured the flag? Well, Chorus was in the squad, and I had him tie some knots from some of our three-point harnesses to make a litter. He was beaming with pride. And? Dodge prompted. And he kept tying it wrong, and I had to keep fixing his mistake. Okay. Dodge motioned for him to continue. And several of us saw his knots. They're just like the one today. Dodge shook his head. Circumstantial, at best. What if? Miguel started. We get him to tie the knot again. I'll bet anything he messes it up. I know he will, Zane agreed. Gillian was not convinced. And how do we get him to do that? Offer him a treat? I have an idea, Zane whispered. And it will require us to sneak away after lights out. Then we better leave Weldon behind, Miguel warned. But I mean... Gillian laughed. <laughs> you don't even know what it is? He shrugged. If it saves you, it's worth the risk. He smiled when her face turned red. What the heck? Dodge grinned. I'm always up for some late night action. It was his turn to smile at Gillian. She rolled her eyes. Well, the way I see it, I have nothing to lose. Let's do it. She turned to Memphis. You? Man, I don't know. That's asking a lot. Zane was patient. You know we do it for you. Besides, you're the most important person in this caper. Caper? Memphis seemed to chew on the word as if savoring it. Why not? We'd better get out of this bathroom before anyone notices, Dodge suggested. He opened the door to peek out and was greeted by a round of applause from everyone in the common room. What were you doing in there? asked Trisglin with a wide grin. <laughs> you wouldn't believe me if I drew you a picture. Dodge grinned back, but it was fun. Wow. Christy Lou, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. wait. I, I, oh, man. <laughs> I did the wrong button. You see that? I'm, I'm, I'm all mesmerized by that <laughs> performance. Holy, guys, is this a rock star or what? Holy smokes. Everybody. <laughs> Yeah, hey, hit the like and the like. You had a lot of love going on over oh, here. Yeah. People calling you rock star. Aww. Dorinda said that uh, you just keep getting better and better. <laughs> hey, before we bring Will on, because I don't want to uh, take away from too much, but before we bring Will on, mm. I noticed something when I was looking over your shoulder. Now, first thing I have to say is, Christy, you read that perfectly. How come I get all these files with, like, things I've got to edit and edit and edit and edit? What's up with that? I'll tell you why. Because I've got people out there praying for me. <laughs> That's why. No, I'm serious. No, I know. That's, That's why. Excellent. Yeah, for sure. That's why. Yeah. No, uh, you know, I it, it gives me more chance to hear your voice. <laughs> no, but I, uh, th one thing I wanted to bring up, and I, um, I didn't know it until you pointed out earlier, and then I was kind of half listening because we were getting ready. I noticed something very clever. This is something, a, a trick that you learn. I don't want to give anything away. But I noticed you were highlighting some things. Is that giving anything away that no. you got for content Not later? No, no, no. So take uh, 30 seconds and tell us about that. Okay, so one of my tricks is I always highlight the name. I always put everything into a PDF. I convert all my files from Word to PDF. And then I highlight the name of each character. So they make sure that I have their voice in my mind. Because, you know, if I'm supposed to be doing Jillian, then all of a sudden I decide that I'm going to be doing Dodge. People might notice that. Yeah, they just might. And then I also put in there, if it's a certain accent, I'll toss in, you know, Irish, Mexican. If I'm and really that's, not that's, there. And that's not something you knew right away. No. Right? That's something you learned by trial yes. and error yes. that would be worth <laughs> a lot of, a, a lot of, take a, t a lot of time off somebody's journey if they knew just that little tip. Absolutely. These are the kind of things we're going to be 
these are the kind of things we're going to be talking about over the next uh, couple of couple of weeks, right? Yes, sir. All right. So, are you ready? Without to bring further Mr. ado. Without further ado, I'm gonna now listen. Wait, I got I got one oh, thing. Oh, he's got his sunglasses on. Yeah, Look I know. How cool I, wait, he is. wait, wait. I got one thing to say first, folks. Again, this is our first time bringing a a, a, a guest on. If there's an <laughs> audio issue, I'm gonna try to get the audio adjusted. I'm pretty sure we got everything planned out, but if something goes askew. Just hang in there. We'll, we'll, we'll get it fixed. All right, I'm going to turn, uh, Will, I'm going to turn your audio on. Woo! And I'm going to give you the big introduction. Are you, do you want to do that or do you want me to do that? I think I should do it. All right, go ahead. We would like to welcome to the Old Crooked Barn Farm studio tonight, Mr. Travis W. Inman. Woo! Woo! And there he is. Look okay. at him and his It's shades. all you guys. Wearing Speak up, Travis. Shades. We gotta see, Will, oh, we got to see if we can hear you. Come on. I'm just kidding. You can hear me. I don't, don't, you dirty dog. Don't do that to me, man. You got us. You got us. I've, I've been planning that all week. Are you kidding me? Oh, bravo. You got us. You totally got us. Travis W. Inman in the, in the, we can't say in the house, in the barn. On the feed. You're comfortable in a barn, aren't you? Was it your very I am. first I've done lots of things things in a barn. Probably <laughs> most of them not discussable in this format. <laughs> <laughs> well, your first hat was a Stetson, correct? You know, I probably couldn't afford a Stetson. It's probably a resist all. <laughs> all right. But, yeah. I better get down to business. I'm supposed to be asking you some very serious questions. We have to be serious, don't all we? All right, let's have it. I'm ready. <laughs> All right, so we're talking tonight about the... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hi, everybody. So glad you could join us. Glad to see your friendly faces out there. Go ahead, Christy. <laughs> what are you waiting on? Go ahead. Let's go. <laughs> okay, so we are going... You and I are going to be working together in the Earth Fire series. Okay, so I was wondering if you could tell me how these books came to being. What inspired you to write this series? I have no idea. <laughs> no, no, okay. All right, all right. No, 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 no. Right. So, um, so the original idea came to me probably some 10, 12 years ago. And I wanted to do a story about a kid who found a, a, uh, an, an old uh, Native American peace pipe in a, in a pawn shop. And he snuck away with it. He lit it on fire, puffed on it, and the, mo the smoke magically transported him into the Ice Age. It didn't take – it took, actually took me longer than I realized that I was going to be enabling children to be smoking in the back <laughs> of some, some uh, pawn Yogi. shop. So, so I had to rethink that, right? Uh, so I love the idea of a kid that didn't belong in the Ice Age being there and having to figure out what he's supposed to do. But I could not really figure out how to get him there without using some form of magic. And so I decided to write a sci-fi story with that embedded as the background. And uh, so I, I tried to imagine, like, what would make time travel possible if it was in this world today? Well, there's very few things that make it available. I mean, it's theoretically possible. It's just not something that's... It's uh, available to us technologically speaking. So I needed a more advanced society than the one we live in right now. So I imagined that if Rome, the, the, the ancient Rome with Caesar and all that, if, if it never fell, if it continued to thrive the whole time, let's say that right after Julius Caesar took control of the empire, that if some – like the, the Senate regained control and reformed the republic – and kept it as a free society, then the changes that would have taken place in our timeline would be viable. We wouldn't have had the – potentially wouldn't have had the Dark Ages. We wouldn't have had um, the, uh, the, the religious wars that took place in the Middle East. We, would, we wouldn't have had all the, the libraries being burned and things like that. And so our technology would have potentially advanced much faster than we did going through the Middle Ages. And so I imagined a world where that was possible and then had those people in that world cross over into our world. 
and uh, that's how I could I could tie it all together. Uh, so it, it, it took a lot of effort. I took a big. I had to put a whole team of people together to make this happen. I'm. May I might have come up with it all by myself eventually, but I had the format, and I sat down with my team, and they all helped me hammer out the details. And so, I would love to take the credit. I'm probably going to take the credit, but the team really made a lot of difference. What was your question? <laughs> the question was, how did the books come to being and what inspired them? I did I answer, answer that? It. I think you did. I think you did. I think you okay. did, yeah. Um, so who is your target audience? Okay, so um, I, the, the only reason I have selected young adults as my target audience is because there's not a category on Amazon that says everyone who's ever read a Harry Potter book, mm -hmm. right? So it's not that I necessarily want to draw in fantasy readers, yeah. but I want to capture that group of people. And the Harry Potter readers are anywhere from the age of, of you know, just old enough to read a book to, well, older than, than Brad. <laughs> so, you know, that's... And if anyone is old enough to remember Old Spice commercials, they probably <laughs> are old enough to have. have I'm so telling you, you're, I digress. you're that guy. But, um, you're the Old Spice but guy. So, the, so this story does not involve magic. It's not a fantasy no, in that sense, but it is a science fiction. And so it's, um, it's, uh, it's, th it's that category of people I want to capture, and that category generally runs with young adults. So, yeah. And, you know, one thing the that best I could do for the time I had. I'm sorry. One thing that drew me to the story, one of the reasons why I felt compelled to audition was because of the, um, the level of obstacles that these characters all have. Um, you know, it, it's safe to call Zane the protagonist, right? Yeah, I think so. And he has ADHD. And then... Um, yes. Weldon is autistic um, to the point that he has, what, like zero social skills. Is that safe to say? Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, everybody on in Section 8 has some kind of, of, of obstacle, and yet they're all working together to try to surmount that. And, you know, that's something I could identify with. Um, I think most people have some kind of struggle, some obstacle. And um, it just makes them very human and relatable. Um, you know, why did you craft these particular characters with these particular um, struggles? Okay, so ADHD is a huge impact on my family. I, I had it as a kid, and at uh, Westbrook Elementary School in Westbrook, Texas in the 1970s, that just meant that I had um, issues with discipline, and I needed to be paddled a lot. And when I got paddled at school, a note went home with, my, with me to my father, and then there was a, you know, a second opportunity for me to learn how to be disciplined. So I, I, I struggled with ADHD and, and nobody really knew about it. No one focused on it and thought about it. And, and when it did come into play, it was dismissed as, you know, kids just need to be disciplined. So my daughter was born and she was more ADHD than I was, God bless her. And so, uh, so she struggled with those things as well. And I, I realized that that is a really major obstacle for a lot of people it's considered a disability i do not consider it a disability i consider it something that that people can use to their advantage if they know how to use it to their advantage it's it helps them think radically in ways that 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 um, normal people don't think so that was one of the things but i can't have every character have adhd so i I, uh, I know uh, that my daughter also struggles with dyscalculia. She's probably really proud of me discussing all of her issues right now <laughs> with everybody. But uh, dyscalculia is something that people that have str they struggle with math really strongly. And so math does not make sense to them, doesn't work for their mind, their brain, the way ordinary people can process math. So that was an issue for her. Um, and then um, I have uh, some very good friends who are dyslexic. And I thought, well, you know, that's another very common theme that's very overlooked in, in real life. And then um, I, 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 I know a lot of people who have or who are on the spectrum. 
And uh, the, the common term for that is with autism or, you know, uh, there's different variations of that, but, but I'm just going with autism because it's the most general term. And I'm, I'm fascinated by how people whose minds are autistic think and work and they're brilliant, mm. uh, but they're just, they're suppressed. And so I'm, I'm thinking I have all these brilliant kids in one group that are dysfunctional because of their disabilities, right? Well, that's, that's how they fail at, at what they're doing, but it's also the very thing that made them fail that they used to make their success. They, turned, they started depending on each other, and they turned their situation around in a way where they're using their disabilities to advance them beyond where they would normally be. And so I, I just wanted them to make ordinary people who struggle with ordinary things to be the heroes for once and not the, you know, just the, the, whatever, the Han Solos, the Jack Sparrows, those people who are just magnificent in every way. Um, I wanted to do something different than that. And I, I think I've nailed it. I think I, I got it down. I think you did too. And it was just that that made it so compelling. You know, that was why I felt I had to audition. Um, and what is the tagline for the book? Oh, gosh, there's four of them. So let me think. Um, weakness, um, uh, weakness, weakness is strength. Um, weaknesses become strengths when they're all you have left. That's right. And I, I love Ooh, that. I like Isn't that. that brilliant? Hey, Will, can I, can I borrow that for the uh, thought of the day for Monday for Barn Show Dude, Shorts? Make it happen. Make it happen. Make it uh, something you've overheard recently. Yes. Uh-huh. I will. Oh, that's so cl- that is such a clever, Hashtag clever Facebook. way to get your ideas across. I love it. It's, that's, it's that's, ingenious. That is like one of the most cleverest way. Cleverest? Most cleverest? Yeah. Well, I'm word sure. of the day. Wait a minute. Word every, or no every word. Once, yeah. Wait, wait. Word or no word. Cleverest. Cleverest. <laughs> Let's vote. Every once in a while my farm boy comes out, it but comes I trust out. me, I read and I have a vocabulary. Well, I, I so. know that. That's why I call you the intellectual <laughs> The redneck. most clever way to make a post I've ever seen. Well, Thank you, you very little. Well, you need to make your own posts by the intellectual redneck. Yeah, I will. Sometimes they'll be intellectual. It, sometimes we're stealing Will's stuff. Yeah, guys, the show is about me. I know. Yes, I know. Really. Stealing, I we're know. stealing Will, Will's stuff okay, now. Okay, so I just, I just want to add that I fully agree with you. I fully agree with you. I mean, we can go all the way to, you know, when I'm weak, then I'm strong in uh, Corinthians. But, yeah, I mean, I, do, I really do believe that we all have a weakness that, become our, that can become our strength if we choose to harness that and figure out a way to channel it in a way that's going to benefit others. and um, But I have to say, your humor, I mean, you just crack me up. You do. You're recently overheard, talking to you in person, talking with you on the phone, working with you. I mean, and I'm, I'm serious. I was, I was kind of wondering if I was going to be able to get through some of these scenes because they're so funny. I mean, it's just hilarious. The whole thing between Miguel and Weldon, you know, Miguel's like ready to explode and Weldon's just totally not getting it. And, but it is kind of, you know, yeah. there's a fine line there because I I'm not trying to make fun of anything, but the humor is just so obvious and it's just good stuff. So like your style. Like your style. Put your shades Thank back you. on. <laughs> All right. Um, why do you think that these books are like timely? Why do you think they're different or important for right now? Why now? Well, um, right now, the, the, the world is so divided, you know, and, 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 and we're going in all different directions, and I refuse to be political uh, in, in this regard. But, but I, I have uh, some very ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things because they have absolutely no choice but to do extraordinary things. Because if they don't, then, then everything, their, their, their lives as they know them are over. Well, you know, that's kind of relevant to us today is we're all living in some very extreme situations and we're ordinary people. So I want to inspire ordinary people to rise up and be more than they are, to have their weaknesses become their strengths. And you have planned some pretty um, impressive and and aggressive uh, marketing strategies. And uh, that was another thing that I found very appealing about this. You're going to be doing some speaking, correct? 
I'm really hoping that the topics that I have chosen to highlight in the storylines will open doors for me to be able to speak at public schools. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to reach out to middle schoolers, to high schoolers, and even elementary age, uh, if, if the judge releases me from the court issue that, well, that's not, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> so um, if, but if I'm able to speak to, to schools, I know I can, I can probably help impact those who struggle with those things and think of themselves as being disabled or having a handicap rather than uh, exploring the use of those yeah. uh, those variants then to, and to get them hopefully some some momentum to move forward so i would love to do that i want to i want to to speak at, at schools and help them out. but i've got i mean i've just i've been trying to figure out what, how to market books differently than than we than anyone has done and so I've got I've got some pretty innovative ideas on that. I, I don't know if that if that's what you're wanting to, to discuss, but I, I do have some pretty innovative ideas that I'm looking forward to trying. Yes, yes, you do. And you know, when I was watching the speech that you and Shara both ser um, shared last weekend um, about you know things that a lot of people would call themselves failures for having happened in their life and where you are now and all that you have gone through, I found it amazing because. You know, you're a very natural speaker and you were, you know, really laying yourself bare. And I think that's what's going to reach kids. It's what's going to reach readers. I really hope you do get into the school system because, you know, I, I heard one time readers are the most selfish people in the world um, because they're looking for entertainment. They're looking for escape. And what I love about audiobooks is that you can use an audiobook as a way to totally transport yourself from whatever you're feeling, you know, um, you know, if I'm driving and I'm I'm really having a lot of anxiety, and I start listening to an audiobook, all of a sudden I'm not there anymore. You know, my son said it very well. It's like you're watching a movie inside your head, and so you know mm, yeah. everything goes away. And um, you know, a story like it's this, the theater of the mind yes, that goes into work there. Exactly. You know, God gave us the imagination, which is infinitely better than any movie. Um. But a story, I mean, a story is a very, um, you know, innate, almost primal need, you know. Um, the shaman, you know, the storyteller of the, of the people group was a powerful person. You know, we need mm. stories. We crave them. And what I love about audio is the ability to reach people who wouldn't read. Um, you know, why, mm. why did you want Earth Fire on audio? Oh, why would you not want it on audio? I mean, I... I, I hear people say, I'm just not sure my, my book is, is for audio. Let me tell you, audio is, is the future. It's, I mean, as, as much as ebooks and Kindle and, and things like that revolutionized the progression of, of, I mean, printing was one thing. You had a book, and that was all you had was a book. And then we had ebooks that came out, and that was, and so audio is the natural evolution of, of publishing. And I don't know. Someday we'll, we may have little small globes that follow us around, and 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 actually have like a movie that hovers in front of us. But but for now, it's audio, and audio is is something I can do when I'm driving. It's something I can do uh, while I'm vacuuming and while I'm watching my wife redo the dishwasher because I didn't load it correctly. And and so all those, I mean, those just things that I can I can be doing. I can be listening to a story. People have earphones on all the time they're podcasting they're listening to audio there there's all kinds of so why would we not want to jump into this market right. plus people that, that have the the issues that i have like adhd and things like that this dyslexia they don't read well it's not that they're not intelligent enough to read it's just a struggle for them and if i can make one thing easier for them and, and have something for them to enjoy then why would i not want to do that and so I, I just think I don't, it's, audio is for everybody. And I think you just touched on something really crucial. Um, you know, as an author, as a creator, you know, we always bring our own experiences into what we're trying to produce. Would you agree with that? If I said no, would you laugh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Yes, yeah, no, I do. I do agree with you. I do. But, 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 I can't but, help it. The two of you around, we had to do a mic check for giggles to make sure anyway. it was okay. <laughs> She's a good laugher. No, I, I do disagree with you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. 
Well, I, I'm just going to say I am familiar with ADHD and um, because of ADHD and that and the accelerated reader program that is required by the elementary school system, the public school system in my community, they have to earn a certain number of AR points. As a result, um, I was exposed to the Harry Potter books on audio and I will always be grateful to God for that because it introduced me to the phenomenal Jim Dale and to me he is the finest the absolute finest example of narration and voice acting um, on audio books out there and um, so that that condition um, opened a door for me to study the craft without knowing I was studying the craft and that's just a simple yeah. example of what an audiobook can do. Um, you know, and, and like you say, vacuuming, wiping down a shower, washing the dishes, driving. I often think about the exhausted mother with a newborn who's just trying to just keep going, to do anything to avoid falling asleep doing what she's doing. You know what I mean? And having somebody keep her mind active would be a blessing too, you know. Um, but storytelling is, is, is just so important. And I think what you're doing is very important because you're tapping into an underserved um, audience. And especially with the dyscalculia, I'd never heard that term uh, before. And, and it's, it's amazing because, um, you know, for me, math was always extremely difficult and, uh, and excruciating. So, and, and I'm so glad that you're, you're honoring your daughter and other people in your, in your uh, life, in your inner circle by writing the story. That's, at least that's what I'm, I'm feeling from all this. I'm hearing from all this. So. A third of the team that I assemble have some form of those issues that we've dealt with. And, uh, you know, s there's even something that I introduced that most people have never heard of and will never, uh, and never understand, never, never appreciate. But I want th those few people that suffer with that. It's something called a pyrophobia. And that is a fear of eternity mm. and or a fear of, of endless depth, something like that. So it's, um, it's something that's very, very rare, but it's very significant for those people who have it. And uh, so, I, you know, I want them to realize that they're, they're not forgotten, too. There's, there's, everyone has something that we, we stumble across, uh, over. And I, and I want them to, to know that there's, boy, there's ways around this stuff. Is that Zar Nero by any chance? Yeah, no, no, no. He's he's too nasty to be to be uh, stuck with something petty like pyrophobia. Do you want to talk about him or any of the other characters at all, Griff? Or yeah, anything? okay, so let's do that. So okay, um, so let, wait, time uh, out, time out. We're gonna lose the Zoom, so we're gonna switch over to that second link. So we're gonna come back to Christy and I. Uh, Christy, you can talk a little bit about. I'll put you on camera while I switch back over and put him on a new Zoom link. We'll bring him back and continue the interview, okay? Sounds good. All right. So, Christy Lou, it's all you. Okay, so what we're going to do is, obviously, we're going to bring Will back, but then we're also going to have a question and answer session after we're done with the interview. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to give you a couple of little tricks that I have picked up. Um, when you're thinking about doing narration, if that's something that appeals to you, um, almost certainly you're going to come across a piece that requires different accents. I'm going to go into this in more detail um, as the series goes on, but one tip that I want to give you is to use your voice memos app on your phone. If you have one, I, I imagine you have a smartphone. Um, try to find either, best of all is if you can find somebody who is a native speaker, who is speaking English with whatever the accent is, and then record some of them talking. You know, preferably have them read something that you um, are going to be narrating, and just listen to it until it becomes part of your um, of your mind, part of your, and, and all of a sudden their accent comes out of your mouth. Just keep listening to it over and over and over again. So that's yeah. tip number one that's that's what i have done for um many of my accents so all right so will's back, back. up so okay, i'm gonna bring go him back on, into will. the camera bring him back into the feed and you guys can pick up from where you left thank you nice transition by the way i mean you just 
dropped right into that. You had good filler there. Thank you. You're yeah. a pro in so many ways. Thank you. Well, you're hired. Thanks. Well, I think we need some <laughs> some thumbs up for Brett for doing that link because I would have been in panic mode. So thumbs we, up for Brett Allen Morgan, the tech guy. Woo! Yay me. Go ahead, Will. <laughs> Proceed. Tell us about okay, Zarn so Hero. Let's, let's talk. Yeah, let's, let's talk about the, the, the characters we got. So Zar Nero, right? Mm. Um, that's a funny name, and uh, I had to vet that through my crew. Uh, but it's if you think about uh, a world where ancient Rome never uh, collapsed, then the word Zar is not going to be unfamiliar to you. So you, so Caesar, uh, Zar became the kind of the vulgar form of that. So And then Nero was the man who burned Rome while, I mean, I mean, historically, they say he, he fiddled while Rome burned. He was also uh, someone who, who uh, hated Christians and persecuted them as much as possible. Now, my, my story is not overtly a, a uh, faith-based story. It's not uh, something where, the, where we tote a lot of, of um, uh, Christian themes, but it is founded with a Christian worldview. So uh, the, while we know nothing is overt about it, it's it's it will meet any secular standard by by any by any uh, society's grouping. Uh, and I did that on purpose so it would reach a broader market. But yeah. uh, so Tsar Nero is the man who is now um, become the arch villain of this of, of this world. So he invented uh, so it, an explanation is required. So. In this world that I created, uh, Mars has been colonized for almost 100, maybe maybe closer to 200 years now. And Mars uh, wanted independence from Earth, from Rome. And uh, so Tsar Nero uh, gained a lot of political strength within his realm at, on Mars colony. And he uh, eventually found a way that he could coerce or force a war between Earth and Mars. Uh, and those, uh, the Earth not even prepared or expecting that there would be any hostilities were vastly overwhelmed and, and almost completely destroyed um, were it not for um, the brilliance of one man whose name was Griff Bannock. Now, Griff is a, a very unique character. He's Zane's father zane being the probably the, the most pro, uh, noticeable um, protagonist in the story uh griff uh, is the man who had the noble intent and the intellect to defeat czar nero and czar nero knew that that was possible so czar nero sent his spies to try and capture uh griff and his family so that, that he could uh, basically get uh get him defeated before the war started but uh uh, i won't i don't i don't want to spoil the story but uh anyway griff ends up in a in in a bad way he's Mm -hmm. he he's he's uh his his uh tenure in the in the book is very short in the uh in the first few pages but um he he left a path forward for zane to fill in with his work uh, and Zane doesn't even know, but his father implanted the memories of how to function and how to operate these these weapons that he designed uh, in his brain. But Zane doesn't know that that's happening. And then one day, uh, the memories began to play in his mind, and he doesn't know that they're not his memories. He doesn't know whose they are, but, but somehow they seem, seem very familiar to him. And so he's living with these memories, trying to figure out what, what on earth is going on. And all the while, uh, the, the, the world around him is burning because um, Mars Colony is completely taking uh, Earth to town. Uh, they're just, just, just dominating them in every turn, and they're, they're on the brink of destruction. And Zane is having these uh, weird memories that he can't explain, doesn't know how to, to identify. And uh, his friends help him figure out what what are these memories what's going on and they they use their skill sets to identify hey what this is what's happening this is our interpretation of that and so basically it's kind of a treasure map the the memories lead them into the the uh, mysterious mines that were below artemis dome on the moon 
and they they find some really really amazing things down in the mines that that uh, had been all but forgotten when Griff did not return, and uh, so they so they're resurrecting a lot of technology that they didn't know. They end up opening a portal that uh, they don't really understand, and they end up in a different time, in a different place, in a different uh, parallel universe, and have. Uh, completely out science themselves and their ability to to get back to where they need to be so so they get themselves in a pretty good jam and I've got to get them back from that place to the moon before Mars colony completely destroys the earth so it's a lot a lot of a lot of things happening well one thing that Did I, I really your appreciated question? yes one thing that I really appreciated about was all the play on you know Roman history and culture and and their lexicon the way you kind of wove that in and out, and um, and I'm really excited about the uh, Ice Age Indian culture, and um, but I, I think maybe we should talk a little bit about um, is it called the uh, the wolf? Was it is it the is it the moon? Oh, or the, the wolf, the wolf, the wolf egg. egg, the wolf yes. egg. I was going to call it the okay. wolf rock. Yeah, the wolf egg. Okay, so that important. takes us back to the original storyline of the kid who was going to smoke the pipe, right? <laughs> Which, no, some kids, smoking is not cool. No. Right? So just, just say no. <laughs> right? But um, so now I, I have a way to get my people to the Ice Age, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the reason they go there is to recover the wolf egg. Well, the wolf egg is a um, – is a – powerful totem that the ice age people the indigenous people in the in the americas had in their possession and they did not know what it was it was just a really really cool thing that that was called the wolf egg well the wolf egg was a meteor that fell from space crashed into the earth during the uh, end of the ice age and it, it slammed into the north american continent well um, it landed in a place very, very close to where a wolf den was. And the Native Americans or the, the indigenous people, I don't know exactly what the proper terminology is for Ice Age people, but um, they, they found this meteor smoldering in a, in a small crater near the wolf den. And so it became known as the wolf egg because the uh, wolf puppies were playing near it. And so uh, they just assumed, well, this must be from the gods. This is something we need to keep with us. And so everywhere the wolf egg went, uh, destruction uh, followed uh, uh, prosperity, and, and, uh, and they would be very prosperous until the next group of people came by, stole it, went to war over it, took it, and then they had prosperity until the next group came by and found it. And so this thing traded hands continually. And so the wolf egg became a thing of tradition. Uh, it was an oral history that was passed down throughout the ages. And um, eventually, the stories were told uh, to the Roman, uh, I mean, not the Roman, well, uh, the, the, the Spaniards that had colonized uh, New Mexico and Arizona and uh, Mexico and all that. So the, the um, conquistadors, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, had monks with them, and they recorded these oral traditions told to them by the Native Americans. And then it became – it passed into legend, and then so uh, someone found these stories hidden in one of the uh, monasteries and thought, well, these are really clever, and they published them, and they became the Earth Fire comics. And so because of the Earth Fire comics, um, then Zane – had knowledge of the wolf egg, which then gives them the advantage over Tsar Nero because they know something Tsar Nero doesn't know. They know an a, unlimited power supply that can take uh, him to task. And so all they need to do is get that power supply back to the earth or back to the earth that they know. And so they've got, they've still got to get out of the ice age. They got to get back to the moon. They got to get back to the war to stop Tsar Nero. All right. Anyone who has ever dreamed of writing has ever been drawn to storytelling or has... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I have a question. 
Was any of that real, or was that out of his imagination? That's where I was going. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That's where I was I going. I mean, that was just totally a, a bam explosion. Sorry. Well, you know, that's... It, but it's it's exploding in the right direction because when I hear something like that and, and reading as much of this as I have read yeah. and um, just sort of dipping my toe into the uh, the Will Inman imagination pool, I'm overwhelmed. I mean, truly. Well, and I, was sitting here, I, I was almost convinced. It, well, it, 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 <laughs> it's, it's so good. It, it sounds like he's reading out of a history book, doesn't it? Yeah. And then, and it and it and doesn't then. sound like he created this. It sounds like he's relaying facts. Would you guys agree with that? Thumbs up. I mean, it sounds to me like he's telling you facts, not yeah. something he created. Uh, like, like I was just drawn in the more he yeah. talked. First of all, the fascination uh, in my mind was the the immense base knowledge. Yes, you have to have in order to kickstart and uh, 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 you know the impetus to fire such a story had to be a base knowledge. Well, when when you write a series like this, Will, um, you know, from what you have sent me. The background information is copious. I mean, I think it was four different files he sent me of background information. So well that, you know, it was like all it was <laughs> like outlines and exposition and explanation, so that you know we could have a really good idea of where the story's going, how it all started out. But it's like you have to write a guide to the book before you write the book. I mean, that just that blows my mind. You know what? Truly, I'm so impressed by that because my book was was so different mine was contemporary it was it was more psychological it was this is and and i just i just want to throw this out there um i do have a copy of wonders of the galaxy mm. wonders of the galaxy and i was honored and privileged to work with uh four authors i did not get to voice will's story it had a male point of view um tyler lewis uh narrated his story but i got to work with Erica Marie Hogan, um, L.G. Westlake. They're, they're, and they'll be on the show. And they will both be on the show. I got to work with Jason William Carp. He will be on the show. And Steve South, who unfortunately yeah. will not be on the, sou on the show. But what I walked away with from that experience was the immensity of the imagination. Anybody who can create and write speculative fiction, who can create and write these worlds and have all this, this technical knowledge, it's really exciting because to me... I was never into sci-fi. It was kind of an eye roll because I always felt like it was so geeky and so, um, you know, it it was fantasy, almost to the point of um, of the absurd. You know, I just I couldn't buy into any of it. And what I loved about this book was that it was based on parables. You know, Jesus' stories and how can we reimagine this in sci-fi? And they're brilliant. What I love with what you're doing is you're taking history. And you're taking, you know, the real life um, challenges that people have and you're reimagining them into a story world in which you suspend disbelief. And I mean, I think the best writers are able to make it so you wouldn't even question, you know, I mean, why would you question that there could be a wand called the elder wand that could defeat all other wands? Well, why would you believe in a wand in the first place? But by the time you get to book seven of, of the Harry Potter series, you don't you don't even ask questions anymore. You're so locked in, you believe everything. You know, Ooh. the wolf egg, it, it, it sounds to me, when I when you start out, it's like wolf egg. And by the time you're done with that talk, it's like, oh, of course, the wolf egg. Of course. And that's how Zane knows more than Zarnia. Of course. Can I, uh, when you narrate, can I go, oh. <laughs> Nobody will notice that. It'll be great. <laughs> uh, what do you, what do you think, Will? Did, well Will, Will, did I did I pass yeah, the yeah. audition? Oh my goodness! Uh, absolutely, yeah. I, you were so so far the best wolf we've had on the show yet. <laughs> Wait, let me do it again. Oh, oh, Brett Allen Morgan. <laughs> oh my goodness! Even better. Even All better. right, so if people um, are intrigued and fascinated by you as an author and a human being and would maybe like for you to speak at their event, where would they be able to contact you, sir? All right, so uh, I do have a website. It is TravisWInman.com. I have temporarily taken it down for a, for a few days because I'm transitioning to a new host, but I, I will have that up a uh, very, 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 very short time, TravisWInman.com. Um, I, I do have a blog. It's called The Blundering Discoverer. Uh, it's, um, 
it's on uh, blogspot.com. I, I don't uh, use it a whole lot anymore. Blogs, I think, have kind of gone the way of the dodo. But, yeah. I um, think so, too. And yeah. then I have Twitter, at Travis W. Inman. I have uh, my TikTok account for what? all my dancing that I do. With oh my Buck. God. You got a TikTok? Uh, he has Buck. Buck is kind of the star of TikTok, I must say. Oh, I could see that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's, that's, yeah, my my grandson has has become the star of TikTok. He's pretty But uh, that is Travis.w.inman, I think. Uh, and then I've, I'm also on Truth Social. I've got um, I, my, my Facebook account. Uh, I have two Facebook accounts, one for me and one for my author stuff. And then there's even the Earth Fire series has its own page. Yes, it does. Uh, there was so there, and I'm going to be doing a lot of world building on that very, very soon. You, we, we discussed, or you discussed, uh, very briefly about world building. World building is huge for me. That's, it's, it, it was the single most important thing that I could do was I had to immerse myself into this world before it made sense to me. Once it made sense to me, then it was something I was so comfortable with. It's like as if I'm discussing our world, the one that we we know and love. And I think that's what a true creator does. Uh, by the way, all those, uh, many of those links that Travis will, why do I keep doing that? That Will <laughs> just mentioned are in the description of this video. You go all about three quarters of the way down. You click on the description. It'll expand. You go down through there and you'll have Elk Lake Publishing website is there. Uh, I didn't get uh, in time the uh, website for Will, but I do have all his, uh, all his other contact information like the Twitter and the uh, LinkedIn and those kind of things. So uh, you can find him down in the, co in the, oh, see the comments. In the description. In the description. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah, so story building the world, it's, it's all just, I'm, I'm stunned and, and, and just so excited to be partnering with you on this project. I really am honored. So thank you. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm uh, pleased as punch to have you invested in my stories, and you you breathe a lot of life into them, and I'm grateful to you for that. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions, Brett Allen Morgan? Well, I've got. Um, let me uh, let me uh, let me see here. Well, I put out on the uh, I put a pinned comment up that we be, would be doing a Q and A at the end. So let's go ahead and open it up for a Q and A. If you have a question for Will, he'll be on for a few more minutes, Christy or myself. We did have one from uh, came from Sarah Smith. And Sarah, I think, was it ACX? Yeah. Yeah. So talk a little bit about ACX because, and I'm going to put just you on for a moment. Okay. And uh, talk a little bit about ACX. She wanted to know where the audition site was, and I assume she meant yeah. ACX. So talk a little bit about okay, that. Okay, so it's just ACX.com. And when you go to the page, um, it'll say on the top right corner, it says titles looking for producers and producers for hire. So you'll want to look at the titles. And then it has on the left hand side has all these different things you can filter through. Um, you know, start out with books in English only. You know what I mean? Like filter out. You only want English unless you are a fluent, fluent speaker of another language. Don't play games. Don't pretend. Um, and then go through, you might you say, you know, female voice only. Um, you might go all the way down to, you know, what's, what type, you know. I, I like to go for the ones that, that ask for a storyteller tone. Um, some of them want enthusiastic. Some of them want, um, you know, something more like um, business-like. There's all of different kinds of ones. There's every genre imaginable. Um, you know, you may only want to do nonfiction. You may only want to do fiction. You can narrow the search by that. Um, there's also three different ways of getting paid, because, uh, of course, you're wondering why. You know, she said, Kat Theo said, you can make thousands. Well, uh, in theory, but when you're starting out, you're probably going to have to do royalty share only, which is if the book sells, and then you make about 20% of what the book's sale price actually is. And, um, and then there's royalty share plus, where you get a per finished hour rate plus the, the royalties, and the per finished hour rate is negotiable between you and the author. And a finished hour is the hour on the audio, not a clock hour. I am not the fastest narrator on the planet. It usually takes me five, I usually get five finished usable audio minutes out of a 60 minute hour. Now, part of that is because I have to have multiple income streams, and I'm very, I'm tired by the time I get to the studio. So that that's part of it. 
Um, but it's just something that you want to keep in mind. And then there's people who just do the per finished hour rate and they just get the flat fee when the book is done and that's it. They don't make anything off it if it sells. So that's just something to keep track of. Um, but yeah, acx.com and you just look for titles and then narrow your search and um, don't give up. You know, if this is something you really want to do, go for it. Do not let yourself quit until you get your first gig and then you can make the decision after that if it's something you want to continue with. Cool. All right, uh, I'm going to bring Will back in here uh, with you. I think, nah, that's not going to work. I'm going to have to do it the other way. All right, so uh, another question from Sarah Smith was, when will the Earth uh, series books be publicly available? I'm going to put Will back in there. Oh, I, I got to change cameras again. <laughs> so, Will, that question's for you while I fix my cameras. Okay. So Sarah, it's it's really good to hear from you. I, uh, I, I Sarah is a very dear friend of mine. We we have a long history, and we we're, I think she would make a great narrator. So I hope that that's something she would pursue. I will encourage her to get into that. So uh, thank you for asking about the the publication. We probably should have mentioned that on our you know just organically. We did not. Um, so the first one is Chrome World. That will be released sometime in September this year. I'm working on the uh, cover art and all, and all that stuff. So, we're, so once all that's lined up, then we'll launch that one in September. The, the second book is called Moon World, which was the sample that Christy read. That book will be coming out in uh, hopefully in December. It's already written. Uh, all four books of the series are already written. I Because it involves time travel, I had to make sure the continuity was there. So all four books are completely finished. They're just being in the editing process. So moon world in december and then uh, ice world should be coming out sometime in february march and then uh, the final book of uh, the new new world will be released sometime probably aprilish may something like that so within within the next six months they should all be available on that and audio will be released as soon as christy has it finished no pressure <laughs> yep <laughs> no pressure <laughs> I'm working on it. I've already started on um, Chrome World, and uh, I have the prologue done in the first two minutes of Chapter 1. So I've got 15 minutes See? out of 11 hours. It sounds hours. great. It sounds great. It really does. It is a process, but we'll get there, I promise. Um, that's about it for uh, – there was a lot of people saying hi, stopping in to say hi. Bobby Myers came by for a few minutes, said hi. He did. Redbeard Bobby, said hi. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Chad Page was on a little Hello. earlier, said hi. Of course, Dorinda and uh, Lori and uh, um, I think that's about it that was common. I saw, I saw Erica was on. Yeah, all that. Thank you. Well, you're right. Erica was on there. I told you, this is not my forte. <laughs> this is usually my job. Yeah. I'm usually comment monitor. But I, 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 this is giving me a real opportunity uh, to this give me a real opportunity to see what goes on during the live stream where I can actually focus on what's happening within the Facebook modules. So I've learned a few tricks while we were in there. So, oh. yeah, buddy. Well, um, in case anybody's wondering, uh, Bob Myers, Chad Page, and Redbeard are Barn Show shorts and Barn Show Big Show regulars, and we appreciate you very, very much. And... Um, we, we just enjoy you. And Erica Marie Hogan and LG, Lori Westlake, LG Westlake, and Dorinda Babcock are three authors that <coughs> I have been privileged to work with through Wonders of the Galaxy. And Dorinda and I are partnering on Chicago, Chica oh my gosh, Colorado Treasure. Chicago. Col not Chicago Treasure. No, not Chicago. <laughs> Colorado I Treasure. Can't, where did that come from? I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, and, and I have several of her books lined up that I'm going to be narrating. I'm so honored to work with her and excited. And uh, it was okay. through Dorinda that I learned the Mexican and Irish accents um, and for her work. So um, I learned the Mexican accent from a wonderful woman named uh, Rosa Alvarado. And I'm so grateful for her teaching me how to speak with an authentic <laughs> accent. Um, and uh, I'm, just, I'm just truly thrilled. Sarah said thank you very much for answering her questions. She really got a lot out of it. You're welcome, Sarah. And she says, go, Christy, go. <laughs> thank you. Go, Christy. Should we go? Probably. Probably. Go? Did you have anything else you want to say, Will, to close out the evening? 
Well, let's just start over from the beginning and make sure everybody's got it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, one. Wait, no, we, no, in no. the music business, in the music business, we say, one more time, everybody. Yeah, one more time. <laughs> one more time. Hey, Will, yeah. we have had a ball having yes. you here tonight. It's been a good time, and uh, I, 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 I am thrilled from the technical. Uh, while you guys were chatting, I'm over here, and tech brain guy, idea guy over here is going. Oh, now I can start this show. Now I, this this works. This <laughs> works, and I've got all kind of ideas that have just been waiting for this little baby to hatch. And I'm all, I'm all, I'm all like this over here. I'm all like, Ooh, yeah, we're gonna go, go, well, go. This show has been six months in the making, so I'm glad to finally be here too. Yeah. So, all right. Well, we're gonna cut you out and end the show, baby. So, uh, thank you, Will. So I really much. enjoyed uh, this. For many, many reasons, on many, many levels, especially the sunglasses. <laughs> I just enjoyed the sunglasses. <laughs> All right, Mr. Inman. <laughs> we shall see you Bye, Will. Thank in you. Chrome World. Yes. <laughs> Toodles. Thanks, guys. It was good to talk to you.